Messieurs, dames, bonsoir. Je m'appelle David Dimon. Je suis président du Conseil international du Canada, euh, le chapitre de Capital National. Uh, good evening. My name is David Dement. I'm the president of the National Capital Branch of the Canadian International Council. Uh, welcome. Uh, we have CPAC with us tonight, um, but we were thinking that, that fellow Canadians and, and others across the country would not be too scintillated by our book draw. So I'm going to do two introductions, one for the book draw and then, and then the one for when we go live, so to speak, without creating too much drama. So I would like to call on um, our Vice President, Lisa Wong. We have two Vice Presidents. And she is going to officiate in her, I'm sure, very efficient and effective way, as always. Um, the, the draw, over to you. This is the book. Hi, I can assure you it's not rigged in that if I choose my own name, I will draw a third name. <laughs> Hamid Georgiani. Congratulations. Susan Brown. Second one, Susan Brown. Ah, congratulations. Thank you very much, Lisa. And uh, feel free to get your book signed by Mr. Clark. Uh, there's, there's a signing table. Mr. Clark is here. And uh, I'm sure that will be possible. Donc, je vais recommencer uh, pour uh, nos collègues de CPAC. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, David Dement. I'm the president of the Canadian International Council in Ottawa. Je suis le président du Conseil international du Canada uh, ici à Ottawa. Et euh, je suis très ravi euh, de, de fait que vous êtes ici euh, ce soir euh, si nombreux. Um, this, this, this evening is, um, in, in some ways, I felt in, in, uh, in being involved in the organizing of it, to uh, honor the right honorable Joe Clark, the wonderful contribution he's made to our country over the years, and the sterling example of... Uh, of, of, of his work and his leadership and, and the way he does that with uh, great kindness and, and compassion. Um, so this is an evening with the Right Honorable Joe Clark. It's, uh, it's sold out. It's, uh, this is the largest dinner, in fact, that uh, we have ever had uh, at the CIC. We, we have 120 people who have chosen to, to stay for dinner. We are also trying to keep up with the, 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 uh, the modern age, and uh, I want you to, uh, people to know the Twitter handle and hashtags for folks uh, to tweet at this event. They are at CIC Ottawa and number sign CIC Joe Clark. Do I have that right, Wissam, our communications director? Excellent, okay. I'd like to thank uh, AV Canada, who has become a, a sponsor uh, with us uh, in, in these dinners, and, uh, and I want to acknowledge that. And before I invite um, Mr. Clark to come to the podium, I want to let you know that he will make his presentation. Then there will be some uh, Twitter questions. Uh, Mr. Clark and I will, will sit at these chairs for the, the Twitter questions and, and discussion, and then uh, Mr. Clark will take uh, questions from the floor. Donc, je suis très content euh, de dire à le, le très honorable Monsieur Joe Clark euh, de prendre la parole. À vous, Monsieur. Merci, David. Et mesdames, Messieurs, I'm delighted to be here with you. I was thinking as I came in that uh, when I was finally allowed into the Department of External Affairs, as it then was, and I, you recall I came in by parachute rather than uh, through the normal process, people used to talk about the old days, the good old days. Well, I was at the uh, PAFSO dinner the other night, and people were talking there. That's the Professional Association of the Foreign Service. People were there talking about the old days, and I realized they were talking about me. <laughs> 
And with that opening, I want to say how pleased I am to be and be back again in the company of so many people uh, with whom I was privileged to, uh, to share many of those uh, great old days. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my book, which has just been drawn by some people. I presume somebody paid for that book, and the commission will come back. <laughs> and then uh, discuss some other matters, some of which uh, as you might uh, choose. And I want to start with a story that is in the book um, about my privilege in attending uh, meetings for six years of the dialogue meetings of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN. Uh, I went, I was in the capital of each of those then six ASEAN countries during that period, and I decided after six years that I would invite them back to a special meeting uh, in Alberta uh, to take place immediately after the, uh, their attendance at the UN General Assembly. It was Thanksgiving in Canada. I knew enough about ASEAN to suggest they bring their golf clubs, which they did. Uh, we were en route to Calgary. We made it to Calgary, and of course a snowstorm uh, closed the airport that was going to take us to, uh, uh, to Jasper. But, it being Alberta, the snowstorm had not closed the Icefield Parkway, the Banff Jasper Highway. So we went up to uh, Calgary and we rented a Brewster bus. And all of us got on this bus and were making our way up to Jasper when we uh, came to the Columbia ice fields and the snow began to fall. Heavy snows. I was a little concerned about this, particularly about one of our members, uh, the Foreign Minister of Brunei, uh, His Royal Highness, the brother of the Sultan. And I turned to him and I said, Your Royal Highness, uh, perhaps you haven't seen snow before. And Ali Alatas, the late Ali Alatas, the then Foreign Minister of Indonesia, said, His Royal Highness has never been on a bus before. <laughs> <laughs> now, I tell that because when you think about it, all of us have buses we've not been on before. We see the world through the frame of our own perceptions, our prejudices, in many cases, our preferences. Um, there's a chapter in my book entitled The Power of Previous Thinking, uh, because seeing the world as it was, uh, even yesterday, is uh, very often a, an obstacle one has to overcome. We are in this country inescapably international. And what's interesting is that we are becoming more so uh, through trade, through the transforming force of in-migration, through the very nature of the modern world. The premise that I've been arguing is that Canada blossomed in the post-World War II new world, in the new society that was created then coming out of war. Our, our troops had been valiant in battle and had won and, and added to the respect that the country had. But in addition to that, many of the countries in the world who might have taken part in a reconstruction of a new world were themselves reduced to rubble. They were not able to do that. We had the capacity and Canada had the will to apply that capacity. And we had uh, an extraordinary uh, group of foreign service officers many of them just back from postings as head of mission in, uh, in, in interesting parts of the world, all of them constrained by the, uh, I guess I can say the word in this context, the conservatism of uh, Mackenzie King, who was not anxious to be involved in any, uh, any foreign entanglements. But when Louis Saint Laurent was named foreign minister, when the war ended uh, and there was work to be done, when the, a question arose, indeed a question about Korea, whether Canada would contemplate engagement in Korea. McKing said no. Uh, as I understand it, uh, Louis Saint Laurent said, we are architects of the United Nations. This is a United Nations exercise. Uh, we will honor the United Nations engagement or I will resign. And uh, Canada thus began a quite active period. It's really the activity I want to talk about. Because in a very real way, we were highly instrumental, well beyond our size and weight in reshaping uh, the world that came to be established after that Second World War. It was not simply in Suez and the United Nations, which we have all known about, uh, which is part of our, of our limited legends about, about foreign policy. It was on a number of other issues. Uh, Dana Wilgris uh, of Vancouver, a Canadian ambassador, 
was the chair of the first group of contracting parties uh, that established the framework for the general agreement on tariffs and trade. Uh, the first secretary general of the Commonwealth was Arnold Smith, uh, a Canadian. Uh, NATO uh, owed, uh, one of the three architects of NATO, was three wise men architects of NATO was, uh, was Mr. Pearson. Uh, John Humphrey uh, wrote uh, all or most of the Declaration of Human Rights of the United Nations. We played a very major role, did Canadians. And that role, I think, helped shape the, the position, it inspired the position that was taken by and large for roughly six decades of Canada in operating internationally. And that happened under parties, of, uh, under governments of both parties, the Liberal Party and the Progressive Conservative Party, as it then was. Now, we are now facing, we are in the middle of, another new world. And this new, new world was generated by the fall of two walls. The first wall, of course, was the Berlin Wall. But the other, and the second was a wall that no one really knew was there until it was penetrated by the insurgent internet. And it literally and fundamentally changed the way we live. Among the consequences, conflict now is less than it was about ideology, and it is much more influenced by divisions and tensions among cultures, among religions, about identity. Another change, wars now are harder to win. We have no further to look than tonight's news on Iraq about how difficult that is. So the importance and the priority to be given to conflict prevention, to mediation, to governance is far more important than it had been. We all know that power is shifting in the world and what is interesting about it is that power is not only shifting, not shifting only among states but between states and non-state actors. Uh, the Gates Foundation is far more innovative than most governments. Greenpeace uh, has more influence on public policy uh, than many national governments do. Uh, Non-governmental organizations of all kinds play an increasing role in the way work, the, the world works and is shaped. Corporations, uh, some of them sincerely, some of them for other reasons, are becoming more active in corporate social responsibility. A, a, a quite major change that is evident to us whenever we look around is that, that the internet, the power of the internet, has helped stimulate a sharp decline in deference for the institutions which once held societies together. Whether those are churches, whether they're banks, whether they're national governments, whether they're business, whether it, they are international organizations that once were thought to be the symbols of neutrality, the Red Cross, the United Nations. They have now been transformed into primary targets in a world where deference is in decline for a number of reasons. One of those reasons is entirely natural. Uh, the world has made great, stri great strides forward in education, in literacy. Uh, the fact that there have been su significant reductions in poverty means that people who are now freed from, po from poverty uh, have a greater sense of ambition uh, that they were not in a position to exercise before, and now they were. It's important to recognize that these phenomena of what could be called instability, of challenging authority, take different forms, but they are not at all regional. They don't happen only somewhere else. They are as international as any other feature of our society. They happen from the European elections to Boko Haram, to Thailand, to the Tea Party, to opposition to pipelines in established countries. Very often today, it's become fashionable to, decry, fashionable to decry the absence of leadership. The reality of democracies is that leaders must persuade a public. And persuading a diverse public, an educated, self-confident public, uh, is much more, different, much more difficult as deference declines and as diversity and distrust both increase. There is now a fashion of leadership courses at eminent institutions around the country and the world. 
I think sometime someone should develop a course on fellowship, uh, on uh, when it is required to compromise, uh, how essential it is if you were to win on one point that you're prepared to open your mind and lay down, and, and, uh, lay down your prejudices or your preferences uh, on another. In this new world, Canada has to assess with clear eyes what exactly our assets are. What will make us strong? What can allow us to contribute more than we might have uh, in the past? Obviously, those assets include our substantial economic strength. They include a military capacity that continues to be one of the strongest and most professional in the world, and one that is increasingly flexible in responding to the challenges it face. Uh, they include, that, uh, those assets do, abundant natural resources. But it is worth bearing in mind that for a long time, we were able to ride on the strength of those hard power assets. Looking, looking back to when Canada became a member of the Group of Seven, we became a member of the Group of Seven for one principal reason. At the time, we had the seventh largest GDP in the world. And that was our ticket into a cockpit that allowed us to have an influence over a wide range of international issues, economic and otherwise. We will never have the seventh largest GDP in the world ever again. Uh, our, our economy is strong, our hard resources are, are strong, but they have to be buoyed up and complemented by other assets that we have. And I think it's fair to say that in the array of strengths that Canada offers, the relevance of our soft power assets is ascending. In a world that is so threatened by various kinds of conflict and difference, we as a country have an earned reputation for managing difference and for respecting difference. I think you don't have the management of diversity without the respect of difference. And we have that and we are known to have that. It is an asset for Canada going forward. We have a reputation, an earned reputation, as a multilateralist. We have in fact, I think it could be said in this diverse federalist country, an instinct to multilateralism that we have used at home, and that we have used internationally, and there remains a very important element of what we uh, can contribute to the world. We've had success, relative success, in governance as a federal country, as a modern country that is relevant elsewhere. We have strong links to and beyond the countries of the West. We were privileged to be part of the G7, but we were also very active in a much broader array of, of countries and of organizations, fraternities almost, in the case of La Francophonie and of the Commonwealth, that allowed us a privileged relation with uh, countries that were, uh, were then uh, outside power and are now emerging uh, societies. I think that one of the things that we have to look at is how we can make better use of cooperation between state actors, governments, and non-state actors, this growing range of non-governmental organizations and other entities which uh, influence events. I won't go into this at length. There's a fairly long chapter on it in the book, all of you who are looking forward to read it. But there's a reality about the power of non-state actors. They can often be more imaginative, creative, sometimes even more courageous in the face of circumstances. What they cannot do is write the rules. The capacity to write the rules belongs to formal governments. And so what needs to be done is to examine much more carefully how we might marry the mandate of governments with the imagination of non-state actors. And again, that is a field in which Canada has a long, strong reputation. We did it with the Mines Treaty. We did it with the International Criminal Court. We did it on the, in the apartheid campaign. Despite the limited mandate of the conference just concluded in, uh, in uh, Toronto, we did it on maternal health issues. We are able to bring people together. Another element of the book on which I'm going to elaborate briefly tonight is the idea of learning another lesson from the post-World War II situation. Not only were we active in, 
in rebuilding a world under challenge. We also developed a series of alliances, formalized those alliances with countries who by and large shared our views. We did that in military means with the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. We did it in, in an active role in the OC, OECD. Um, and um, it has become a, a, an instrument of the progress and the contribution we've been able to make uh, through, that, uh, through that period of time. Well, we have to ask ourselves now, in a world that has changed, who are our natural allies now? Obviously, we want to respect the alliances that we have. But we should, just as we formed the alliances in that period, in the uh, framework of the world that was then taking shape, what alliances should we be forming now in the framework of the world that is taking uh, shape? I've indicated, and those should be both states and non-state actors. Uh, where can we most profitably, profitably form these kinds of alliances? I should be clear here. I'm not talking about formal organizations uh, like NATO or other organizations of this kind. And I'm really talking about a deliberate habit of identifying a number of countries with whom Canadians would meet much more regularly and consistently. And countries that, are, that would be outside our, our normal or, uh, or traditional range of, uh, of partners, or countries uh, with whom we've had some relations in the past, but uh, relations which should be augmented. For example, we should be looking hard, it seems to me, at, some kind, at, a, more, uh, at a closer relation with a huge state like Indonesia. We should be looking at what more we can draw out of a relation with Mexico. We have a trade relation to them. If you look at the statistics, not much trade is happening. Uh, but what could be done in a country that is going to uh, have growth rates that will, will be far larger uh, than ours and that is already seeing itself as an effective uh, middle power in the world? Uh, what about South Korea? We should be looking at the opportunities <laughs> we have with, uh, with South Korea. We should be looking, despite present challenges, at Turkey and what opportunities there are there for a longer-term uh, relation. We should obviously be looking at countries like the Nordics and Australia, uh, with whom we have long had, had things in common. And it's not a, that's, that is not a, a, uh, at all a complete list. In fact, I dared to put a little list in the book so that those of you who know these situations better than I uh, can add to it. But the idea of recognizing that the world has changed and the people with whom we speak regularly should consequently change so that it affects our capacity to understand and respond to and, uh, and lead, small l, lead in, uh, in international affairs. Um, we have to balance our natural pull to traditional allies. We have to keep our traditional alliances in place, but reach not be confined by them, but reach beyond them. I'm going to speak very quickly tonight about uh, state-to-state -state alliances in Asia, uh, and then about a domestic alliance with significant international implications on the question of climate change. With regard to Asia and briefly, no one disputes the huge economic and security impact of Asia. But no one, nor would anyone familiar with Canada's policy and position, deny that we have a lot of work to do to establish ourselves uh, in that huge and diverse continent. It struck me as foreign minister that one thing Canada lacked in Asia was a sort of a standalone sense of identity. Uh, people in Africa, by and large, countries in Africa, by and large knew what Canada was. People in Europe knew because, by and large, we came from there. Uh, we share a continent with Americans. But I found it difficult, despite the best help and advice of gifted officials, uh, to ensure that people understand, understood how a Canadian was different from an American, how a Canadian was different from a Brit, uh, how we could keep up with the Germans. And I think that that is, uh, uh, now contest me on this, it is, it, is, it is my view that that question of having an identity around which a reputation builds is important in anything we undertake, including our work in uh, our work internationally. Um, we have, with many countries of the region, historic connections. 
uh, we have, in many other cases, many more recent investments and connections. And that connection to Asia, this is worth thinking about, has been reinforced profoundly by our own in-migration. Uh, it's a remarkable fact about Canada that, we, that our, our attitudes towards newcomers have persisted, in fact thrive, even in a time when so many of the newcomers are not like the people who were here before. It, is relative, it was probably relatively easy, relatively easy, for Canada in our early days uh, with our Scots and French and, and English and Irish uh, to welcome someone who wasn't very different, someone from, from Norway or someone from Poland. Uh, the religions were the same, the skin color was the same. Uh, this was a relatively easy challenge. What is interesting is that now for the last, what, 40 years at least, some of you would know the figures, the sharp increases in our in-migration have come from countries where the color of the skin is not white, where the religion is not necessarily a, a Christian, where there is marked diversity in cultures, and yet we have been able to absorb that and thrive with it in this country. Now, what use can we make of that internationally? What use can we make of that uh, in terms of establishing an identity in Asia that would be useful to us. And I'm not simply thinking here exclusively in trade terms, although that would be important, uh, but also in terms of the, the influence that, um, uh, that we might uh, have. As we look at, um, I'll need some water, I'm afraid. David also took his knife so that he can, he can tap the glass if I tend to run over a little bit. Obviously, when we look at, uh, at Asia, we, we have to focus very heavily upon China. I'm not going to speak about China tonight. I'll say read Paul Evans' book, uh, Engaging China. Uh, it contains advice we should follow and is uh, so readable that even I could uh, understand it quickly. But I'll talk about two countries. One is South Korea. South Korea is a country in which we have missionary ties that are almost as deep and extensive uh, as those that we, uh, we have with, uh, with China. 27,000 Canadians fought in the Korean War. Um, we, there is now a formal trade agreement between Canada and, uh, and Korea, the first of Canada's with, uh, with Asia. Uh, there is a strong development on the part of, uh, of, uh, of Korea in, uh, in international development issues. Uh, they are looking for allies other uh, than their immediate neighborhood or indeed uh, than the United States. That is a possibility uh, for us to pursue. And I want to come back to Indonesia. Indonesia is a huge country, just as we are. It is a diverse population, just as we are. It has begun to develop a serious interest in democratic reform and indeed is working with its colleagues in the region to spread the understanding of democracy through the Bali Forum uh, and other things. It is multilateral, different field than ours. It was active in forming the Non-Aligned Movement. It is still uh, a member of that organization. It is a member of ASEAN, which was really the first multilateral organization in the region and remains a very important uh, portal for us. And perhaps most significant of all, it has the largest Muslim population in the world. And, in a, and, a, and a society that is, by and large, a moderate uh, Muslim population. So in a world torn by these tensions, where alliances have to be found of people who understand and deal with and have credentials on diversity, it seems to me that is worth, worth looking at. Let me speak briefly now about the domestic partnership, one on climate change, which obviously has international implications. I haven't seen the announcement today, I understand and I'm not surprised that it was an approval with several conditions, which uh, makes, uh, makes sense, but I, I obviously can't comment on that. Um, we know that we have extraordinary resource wealth in the country, but we also have to be aware that there is growing competition from other countries that also have very significant resource wealth. Whenever anyone talks about the changes in a, company's, in a country's prospects as a result of shale, shale gas exploration, they talk about the United States. Well, shale gas and shale oil 
are not at all confined, nor other new discoveries, uh, to the United States. Some 44 countries uh, now have important uh, reserves, and some of them are small, are large countries, Russia, China, Argentina, Algeria. <laughs> in terms of conventional production, which has been a field of Canadian strength for a long time, there is really quite a rash of discoveries uh, in conventional fields around the world. A partial list, Mozambique, Cyprus, Israel, Kenya, Ghana, the list goes on. So, we cannot assume that the world will necessarily come to our immense resources simply because we have those resources and might want them. Second factor, there are now significant new obstacles to transport in Canada. Uh, the ones we're familiar with are driven largely by environmental concerns, by Aboriginal groups, and in some cases, the case of British Columbia, by a government. Those are, ad are aggravated, I think, by adversarial relations between at least the Aboriginal community and the government of Canada and the environmental community and, uh, and the government of Canada, the reputation of Canada. A third factor, energy companies need a long-term context for the size of investment they are contemplating here. Um, these are huge investments. Unless they have some sense as to what the rules are in Canada, they will, in a market that is uh, open to them elsewhere, look around. That's natural. That's how business operates. But what's more significant is the change in the way business operates. There is now a new, and in many cases, a quite serious focus on issues that were not considered to be part of the bottom line. Some of the major energy companies in Canada, Suncor, uh, Imperial Exxon, uh, Total, are focused now upon the environment, on one, one hand, trying to find common ground. Not to say they found it. The importance here is the attitude to look, the willingness to partner, uh, the realization this is a factor which may not have been there before, and very significantly in the development of alternative energy sources. Uh, Exxon the other day was quoted as saying they expected that to be a more lucrative market for them uh, than, uh, than conventional, uh, uh, conventional sources. And another factor we have to take account of is that for three or four years in a row, Canada at international climate change conferences was distinguished by winning the award that was known as the Fossil of the Year Award uh, because we stood against most of the movements uh, in, um, uh, towards recognizing or responding to climate change. That reputation matters to us. I believe, for example, that that reputation on Canada's part is one of the factors that has, caught, that has delayed approval on the Gateway Pipeline. Uh, it, it, it just is a, uh, it, it is not something that the people to whom the President of the United States has to pay attention are going to forget. Uh, it obviously could have an impact upon investment decisions uh, here. Now, the next climate change conference is in Paris in December of 2015. And I suspect that if there is not a significant change in the approach that Canada is seen to be taking to some of these issues, we will have unusual difficulties at that conference. And I want to raise that not simply as a, as a source of alarm, but as an inspiration to the kind of partnership that I think we should be looking at here that in this case would start domestically but would have very significant uh, international implications. Uh, I think that there is a readiness on the part of several of the actors uh, to be brought together and to look at what kind of, if I may use the word, common future uh, we might uh, have. I mention in the book my view, in fact it was the inspiration of, of writing the book, uh, frankly, my view of the importance of Canadian conversations. Because we are a vast and diverse country, uh, we often don't know nearly enough about our neighbors elsewhere. And when you look back at some of the signal accomplishments of this country, very many of them have, to, have had to do with one form or another of national Canadian conversations. Disproportionately, those occurred through royal commissions, which were a formalized kind of national conversation. 
but they gave us the equalization program. They gave us agreement on, on, on tax, uh, uh, tax arrangements. They gave us the national health scheme. They gave us the Canada Council and the other attributes of, of Canada's uh, cultural institutions. Uh, they gave us the free trade agreement. And so the story goes. And they were places where people came. They gave us the Official Languages Act, in effect. Uh, th this, is the, this is a process that Canada has used uh, for a long time. We haven't had a royal commission for, since Roy Romano in a one-man commission six or seven or eight years ago. We no longer have first minister's conferences, which, while they can be challenging, uh, were nonetheless very often productive. They allowed, they were forced people uh, to look at the perspectives of others. And the risk is that the country will sink into its own silos. Uh, there is a tendency to do that when you're well off. There's a risk of Canada becoming a kind of a gated community going out in the morning to earn our wealth and then coming back and, and shutting the doors. And that can happen internally as well as, uh, as internationally. So we need to have those Canadian conversations. And in that case, I am particularly, in that context, I'm particularly pleased to be here with the CIC because I think one of the very encouraging developments on international affairs in the last five or six years has been the vibrancy of discussions about foreign policy alternatives, not simply through the CIC, but in universities and elsewhere across the country. And there's no question that the, uh, the Canadian International Council has been a major, uh, a major player in that, and consequently has the capacity to take a look at where we can go next, what the topic should be, how we might proceed. To summarize before concluding, since the Second World War, Canada has been seen in the world as an activist, multilateralist country following a nonpartisan foreign policy. I recount in the book the conversation I had at the heads of Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in 1979 in Lusaka, uh, when after the first day's sessions, the president of that meeting, the president of Zambia, Kenneth Kawunda, came up to me and said, Mr. Clark, many of the things you're saying are quite similar to those Mr. Trudeau said. And I said, well, Mr. President, we represent the same country. And that, by and large, has been a, a hallmark of, uh, of Canadian uh, policy. Uh, often it's been innovative. We've been adept, if I, can use, if I can quote my own phrase, at the prospect of leading from beside. It has not mattered to Canada so much who is at the head of a table where decisions are taken. What matters is, does the table work? Is it possible to make those kinds of, that kind of progress? And yes. Uh, we have been able to do that. And that reputation developed over those decades was a Canadian brand, recognizable through changes of government, not always predictable, but by and large reliable. The Harper government today is emphatic on issues which interest it. Israel, Afghanistan, Crimea, bilateral trade, LGBT rights, and some others. But it is less attentive to previous bedrock policies of the country. Not just the United Nations, which everyone notices and talks about, but also, for example, the United States. Uh, the comment the other day by Prime Minister Harper about um, uh, Canada being more frank uh, than other, quotes, more frank uh, than other countries, and he was obviously speaking in the aftermath of President Obama's uh, statement, that is a remarkable departure from normal conduct between Canada and, uh, and the United States. Um, we have, and they have, they have shown less interest in the non-trade side of relations with the developing world. Often it seems to me they are motivated by domestic or ideologic concerns, characterized by, I can only call them, policy eruptions rather than a broad strategy. That's important because we've now begun a long pre-election season. And the test over the next several months will be whether significant decisions will be driven by international imperatives and opportunities or by partisan domestic uh, considerations. I think one of the obligations that all of us in this room uh, share is uh, to try to build an informed public interest in international issues. And I think that this next 18 months with all of the deadlines and all of the crises that we're facing uh, it will be a, a critical time in doing that. Now, I have brought with me, I'm going to spare, was going to deliberately spare you from slides, but I brought these along just in case there was no applause. 
and uh, <laughs> I needed to divert your attention to, uh, to something else. A little bit of background, uh, a disclosure here. I am a member of the board of an organization called Globescan uh, Incorporated, a Canadian uh, polling and information uh, company that uh, does some very interesting uh, international uh, polling. Primarily, uh, now, primarily for a number of uh, large international corporations who are interested in, commercial, in consumer uh, attitudes. Uh, and it was that, in, uh, but also because the, the people who are at the heart of Globescan are themselves very deeply committed to principles of sustainability. And uh, that has led them to uh, undertake a number of findings, which I will recommend you look at, but I'm going to bring three to your attention uh, tonight. One of them has to do with the question of deference and institutions. There's been a sharp decline in trust in all institutions over that period 2001 uh, to 2014. Trust in global, global companies, this was prepared primarily for corporations, is now at an all-time low among the tracked countries. And the tracked countries you'll see at the bottom include China, France, Germany, India, Indonesia, Kenya, Mexico, a long list of... Uh, of others. It's interesting to note that science, which for years uh, was the one uh, field where, which, which regularly attracted uh, public trust, is now in the decline. It's interesting to see where the, the United Nations uh, uh, is. Uh, NGOs, which, we had, which many people had thought enjoyed a high degree of public trust, in, in fact have seen that, uh, uh, that tailing off. I won't leave it up uh, forever, but it is an interesting uh, uh, state of the uh, indication of the state of the world and, and a, despite my association with a highly professional organization whose uh, research and data uh, one can, uh, can count upon. Because they are dealing with uh, consumers and activists, consumers in the commercial field and activists in terms of people who want to work for, for change, they are particularly interested in identifying certain clusters of the population, certain characteristics uh, that recur across, uh, various, uh, uh, across various borders. And they have come up with the phrase of the aspirationals. They have looked for the people whom they call aspirational. And, by, and what they have found is that by and large, the people who are trying to change things, are their characteristics would be that they are younger, disproportionately. They are female, disproportionately. They have a sense of being empowered. Uh, they don't feel that they are uh, on the by, by, by roads of life. They think they have an opportunity to influence things. They're engaged. Uh, they are optimistic. They are, in a phrase that one of the, that Chris Colder of Globescan used, they are builders, not protesters. So they've taken a look as to where in the world, whoops, I've, I'll have to come back. There, is the, there are the, this is the finding on aspirations. It's a little hard to read even from, from any distance, but there are some interesting figures there. Aspirationals in Canada account for 41% of the population. Aspirations, aspirationals in Nigeria account for 43%. Uh, in India, 58%. In the USA, 34% and declining, uh, perhaps only temporarily. Uh, what is interesting about this is that uh, in an age when so much is changing and when there are so many problems to be faced, there is sometimes a question as to whether populations are interested in change, are prepared to, to support initiatives that might be taken uh, to achieve that kind of change. And I think that that is, uh, uh, I think probably this is the thinking that was going on in Globescan's mind, they thought that probably people who are prepared to change what they consume or look at better ways to, uh, to buy consumer project, uh, products would also be uh, susceptible to, interested in, becoming agents of change in their countries or internationally. Uh, it's, not a, it's not bad news. Uh, it's not absolutely accurate, obviously, but it is an indication, as polling generally is, of trends. And finally... For years, uh, Globescan has been running a poll with the BBC uh, ranking, uh, ranking the reputations of countries. They ask, do you believe that country X has a more positive or a more negative impact on the world? Um, 
we have generally done quite well in that. This, is, this draws upon the responses to that question uh, just in three countries, the three North American countries. And what's interesting is that, what's most interesting about that, I think, is that there has been a significant decline in the attitude Canadians have towards our view of our role in the world. Uh, from a, a figure in the low 80s uh, in uh, 2005 uh, to a figure now of 68%. Uh, again, these aren't decisive, they are only indicative. But what they indicate is that this country, which has so much to be optimistic about and which has been prepared to undertake changes in the past, uh, may be losing its taste uh, or its enthusiasm or its optimism about uh, that possibility uh, happening. Thank you very much for our, David will now tell me and us what we're going to do next, but thank you very much for your attention. Oh, you have to be. I have to be what? Okay. Okay. So we're, we we. Oh, are you're seated. afraid I wasn't hooked up or no, turned no, on. No, we're seated at just where we need to be. Um, when we did our practice, uh, it was reversed. But but you were quicker than I was in remembering to go to that chair. So I just took the nearest seat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the camera lines are, are are better this way. We have for uh, whom? For the audience to see <laughs> okay, you, sir. Good. We, we, congratulations on, on uh, a stimulating, excellent presentation, uh, at which, which people from the Twittersphere were, have, have been anticipating since before you gave the talk. <laughs> and it, in fact, uh, have been sending in questions for us to think about uh, for a period of about 10 days. And we had a number of different questions, as you know, are, that were sent to you. And uh, two of them were selected. So the job I have is to ask you, uh, first off, these, these two questions from Canadians who may not be in this room, but, but wanted to ask you these questions. The first one, uh, economic diplomacy, cultural diplomacy, cyber diplomacy, environmental diplomacy. What is 21st century diplomacy? Well, I guess one, an one easy answer is all of the above, but the question is how do you coordinate that and how do you, uh, how do you take advantage of it? I think that the, uh, I've been concerned for some time that um, uh, because of the preferences of the, the government of Canada, we were focusing uh, too narrowly upon the economic and trade dimensions of our relations, uh, not just with, the, not particularly with the developed world, but with the developing world. And I think that that sends uh, the wrong kinds of signals. So part of the question, I think, part of the answer to this is how do we mobilize people who can be effective in each of those fields? Uh, we should probably have on the list, the questioner should have on the list, uh, scientific diplomacy, uh, given the, the high status that scientists enjoy uh, uh, internationally and our own uh, accomplishments in that field. But I think that uh, part of this, it, it used to be, I think, that, uh, that diplomats were engaged in discussing uh, the importance of a particular initiative. I think we are now, for better or worse, more in a field where, uh, I'm sorry to use the commercial term, the brand uh, is, uh, is more important. It sets the context within which uh, uh, representations might be made. There are people in the room who would know this better than I do, but uh, there was certainly a time in, in diplomatic practice when uh, Relationships one had cultivated over time in a particular capital or the group of people were quite often decisive in the, in the capacity to deliver a Canadian message uh, to uh, those people. That they're still decisive, uh, but there is also this larger context of uh, how the country is seen, how the future is seen. Because I know there are people in this room uh, who think about uh, cultural diplomacy, um, particularly uh, it's important and particularly with them in mind, perhaps you might say, elaborate a bit about the role of cultural diplomacy in, in a country's foreign policy. Ask the French. Uh, a, a huge proportion of the, uh, the French diplomatic budget is uh, directed to uh, the language and the culture of France. And uh, uh, while one might disagree with France's actions from time to time internationally, there's no doubting uh, their effectiveness. Now one might say that they have a more distinctive and definable culture to pursue, but nonetheless they regard it as a value and the evidence uh, is, is there. And I think that in many cases um, uh, the uh, culture is very broadly defined. Formal culture 
it can be immensely important. We've all had, people in this room would have very powerful uh, anecdotes to tell about the impact of a Canadian ballet or a Canadian presentation here or there, literally anywhere in the world. Uh, but cultural diplomacy uh, also involves uh, persuading uh, regimes that are suspicious about governance practices uh, to, to become involved in those questions. I think it's a very important part of the, uh, of the equation. And in our case, it is another means by which we can draw the larger Canadian community, the large array of Canadian attributes into, um, uh, I don't really want to say the service of the country internationally, but the representation of the, uh, the country internationally. Thank you. The, the second question that uh, has come from, uh, from tweeters in the days leading up to, to our gathering uh, is this. Given the recent events in Iraq with a militant group seizing control of Anbar province, including the city of Mosul, I guess this question just came in the last few days, uh, what role do you see Canada playing? And as we were discussing earlier, the, the, this raises issues about our relationship with Iran. I knew this question was coming and I warned Michael Shenstone I was going to turn it to him and uh, put him on the, uh, on the spot, but he has declined. And, uh, uh, in part because it's, a, it's an immensely uh, uh, complex uh, issue, obviously. I think it may be the case that the, um, the jihadist forces uh, that have drawn so much attention and created so much alarm very recently uh, may not be able to sustain their force. They, they clearly have at their center a group of uh, very determined uh, and ruthless uh, radicals. But they are also able to take advantage of a widespread discontent uh, with the government in Iraq and with circumstances generally. And it may well be as, uh, as there is response to their pressures and as time passes, that, uh, that that capacity to mobilize will, uh, will decline. But it certainly does, uh, for, on the question of Iran, um, it, uh, it opens another opportunity to discuss whether there is room for cooperation between Iran and others uh, on a question that can uh, contribute to a sound, uh, forward-moving uh, arrangement. Uh, the Americans and others are being very careful, I'm moving away from Iran, very careful in terms of their own, uh, their own military engagement and I really have no, uh, no knowledge of, of what uh, opportunities uh, might be open there. People who have dealt with the region longer than I have uh, very, genuinely, very genuinely fear that as a result not only of these developments but of all the precursors. Uh, that partition may end up being uh, a future for, uh, uh, for Iraq. But more than that, I can't say, and there are, this is one question and I could say with confidence, there are better experts in the room than I am. Uh, but I don't know that they have a clearer idea uh, as to what might be done. Right. Um, in uh, the situation of Iran, uh, with, uh, it seems in the American ferment, uh, a uh, sense that this would be an opportunity to deepen um, cooperation between the United States and Iran. This, this speaks to being in a position to, to, to engage. We, since September 2012, have suspended our relations with Iran. Would you, Mr. Clark, um, perhaps want to make any comment about that decision of, of our government uh, two, two or so years ago? I think it is a mistake not to have a presence in Iran. Uh, I think it would be a, a similar mistake to exaggerate the influence we would have if we were there, but we would have some. Uh, people who, uh, uh, it, it would help us know what is going on. People who might not be prepared to talk to some of our allies, but might be prepared to talk to us, would have someone to talk to. Uh, there is, I, I think, uh, uh, presence is, uh, is always preferable to uh, uh, to absence. It's a policy that I've never fully understand. Uh, the minister is, is quite articulate on most questions. He has not been very forthcoming on uh, what happened here. Undoubtedly, there were unusual circumstances. There are always unusual circumstances uh, that contributed to the, uh, the decision at the time. Uh, but your question is about what should be happening going forward. And I think that we should be present in Tehran. 
it, it's you know wonderful to have this opportunity to be part of this Canadian conversation with you. Uh, and I, I totally agreed with what you were saying earlier about the, the role of the CIC in that. So I, I feel um, that we're doing a good work. You mentioned in your comments about uh, n natural allies now. Um, and, and part of, of, of the background for that is perhaps the U.S. Is, is not so omnipresent in our thinking as it had been. I have a, a book uh, mm -hmm. on Canadian-American relations called Doing the Continental, and uh, I've been asked to do a second edition. And so one of the things I'm grappling with is the question I want to ask you, because um, it would be helpful to me, <laughs> your answer. Um, it, has the landscape changed? Do, do we have to think about, just in, in five years, or the book came out three years ago, uh, but you know, I was, let's say, writing it and deeply thinking about it five years ago, has the landscape changed sufficiently now that, that we need to conceptualize the United States differently in, in our national imaginings. And you know, when you think of the rise of China, when you think of the rise of middle classes generally in the world, that means that there's a lot more consumers out there and there's another major power that, that simply weren't so present five years ago. All of that's true, but what's important to, to remember about these rising powers is that what's phenomenal is their rise rather than the fall of the United States uh, or others. Is there been an attitudinal change in the United States? You saw the figures on aspirations among, uh, among people that are lower in the U.S. than in many other countries in the world. Uh, that's quite remarkable given the, uh, the nature and history of the United States, and it may very well be, be temporary. This is a, a hard time uh, for Americans. I think the, the reality is they are going to be a very significant power, not least with regard to Canada for as far ahead as any of us can foresee. Uh, are they going to occupy as much space as they did before? No, uh, because others are, are moving in. Is the world as it was when they, when they occupied so much space? They and the Soviet Union? No, it isn't. Uh, and uh, there is a variety of other uh, sources for that kind of engagement and a, and a variety of other countries uh, from, from which it can come. So, and we, Can Canadians have always talked about uh, relying too much upon the United States. Uh, very few people anywhere have been prepared to do much about it, but we've always talked about that. It's going to become a more serious question now, not moving away from the United States, but looking for other, uh, uh, other opportunities to, uh, other, uh, other movements, other societies with which we should be associated. One other point to make is that at our best, one of the most successful things we've been able to do with the U.S. is work closely with them. Uh, we, there tends to be more attention uh, paid to the, uh, the disagreements uh, that we have. Uh, the President of the United States who shakes the, the Prime Minister by the lapels or whatever it was. Uh, uh, he that shook didn't the happen by, to you. Didn't happen to okay. me, no. Uh, but, um, uh, but in fact, there has been a very effective relationship between uh, Canada and the United States on a wide range of issues, not least because while we're similar countries in many of our values, we're different countries in our reputations in some ways and in our capacity uh, to do things. And I think that, will, that may even increase as, uh, as time goes forward. I was sitting with Michael Ignati of, uh, not too long ago and uh, I said, Boy, it was a shame that uh, you weren't elected prime minister from the point of view of you, the Kennedy School, Obama's very associated with Harvard, and, and uh, you, would, you, 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 you're, you have a lot of uh, advisors who, who are crossing paths, and you might have, a, have quite a similar vision of the world, and, and what would that have meant for Canadian-American relations? And I was very surprised by his answer. He said, well, you know, David, I don't think so, because the, there are these fixed interests that, that our two countries have, and I'm not sure it would have made that much difference mm. who was sitting in the Prime Minister's chair. You've sat in the Prime Minister's chair. Would you agree with what Mr. Ignatieff said? I think it makes a difference who sits in the Prime Minister's chair. I think it makes a difference who sits in the diplomat's chair. It's not the decisive uh, factor, but I think it, uh, and I'm, I'm not here seeking uh, a quarrel with, uh, with Mr. Ignatieff. I just think that uh, what I have seen uh, both from opposition and from uh, office, is that it does make a difference. Human relations make a difference. There was a fascinating study by, is it Chris Sands, about five or six years ago, uh, that, talked, that, that attributed part of the, 
very substantial cooperation between Canadian and American diplomats of a particular era to the fact that they had fought together in the same war, they'd gone to school together in the same places, and this, um, uh, it, to this, in, at, at this scale, the Prime Minister and President are less relevant, but on the actual working scale, we knew where they were coming from, they knew where we were coming from. And uh, uh, that has not been the case uh, for quite a few years now, uh, because all of us, uh, were f either we were not in the wars or we were fighting in different wars, or in more cases, people go to school in different places, the, those, that web of personal connections is different. Um, I think the lesson from that is that um, we have to build those webs wherever, we have to build upon those webs wherever they exist, including in the U.S. Well, it's been great to have a chance uh, to discuss with you one-on-one, -on -one, uh, to ask a couple of questions of my own and convey the, the Twitter questions. We're at the stage now where we'll open up questions uh, from the floor. So if, uh, if people want to come to the microphone, which is over here, um, I can maybe ask you something while, while people have a chance sure. to, to get uh, to the microphone. I'd prefer to stand to answer if I Would could. Would you? Absolutely. Yeah, if I could. Okay, well, um, I see uh, someone coming to the microphone, uh, and, uh, and you might go, go to the yep. podium then. Okay. I don't want to take you out of the picture frame. Do I need to do something with my mic, sir? I'm okay. And uh, thank you very much for your remarks. You always seem to leave an audience with pearls of wisdom to reflect on. And I'd like to, uh, us to take a moment to explore two metaphors that you've raised with us today. You opened with a remark that we've all been on, um, we all have buses that we haven't been on yet. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, in the span of your career, what are the most memorable buses that you discovered and how did they impact you? Hmm. And the second um, metaphor that, uh, that I have in mind is the fall of the two walls, Berlin and information. What in your view is the next wall to fall and what kinds of challenges and opportunities does it pose for Canada? Well, part of the impact of the fall of the, uh, of the fall associated with the internet was that nobody saw it coming. And I think it's probably the case that we won't be able to predict with any kind of intensity, what, uh, with any kind of accuracy, what's going to, uh, what's going to, uh, uh, to happen next. Um, at least that would be, would be. Uh, uh, <laughs> we don't know what surprises, surprise we're going to have to respond to tomorrow. Uh, and um, uh, so I, I'm afraid I can't do better than that on that question. My first trip as foreign minister to Asia was in the hands of the then ADM Asia Earl Drake. And uh, we uh, landed in, I think, Singapore. And he said to me as I was getting off the plane, you're not there yet, being Asia. And we then visited most of the countries of ASEAN. And uh, in every one, I would turn to Earl and I'd say, are we there yet? And he'd say, well, no, not really. And finally, on the way into Jakarta, I asked him, and he said, well, we're getting closer. Um, and what that uh, taught me, I guess, uh, was uh, on, the, on one hand, how much I didn't know and, and had to learn about uh, these things. But on the other hand, how different circumstances are. And that uh, while we all have to generalize sometimes, we also have to come down to, uh, to quite, um, uh, quite particular cases. One of the most important lessons I learned, in fact, was not as foreign minister, but was as constitutional minister. And uh, the lesson I learned there, I believe, is that uh, when you get serious people down around a table, no matter the differences that brought them there, and you have a respectful <coughs> two-way conversation, giving and taking, you can find agreement on a wide range of issues. Now, I'm very uh, cautious about saying that because uh, there were two episodes in the Charlottetown Accord. One was when the leaders agreed and the other was when we took it to the people and they were opposite uh, responses and I accept the verdict of the people who voted against that agreement. What is interesting is uh, how uh, sweeping and successful that negotiation and that agreement uh, uh, turned out to be. And it teaches me that there are very few issues uh, that would not benefit from discussion. And there are very few people 
obviously some, but very few people uh, whom one cannot engage in a serious discussion about uh, some common way forward if you try. Hello, Mr. Clark. Uh, my name is Blake Ham. I'm a uh, graduate of the NIPSIA program we spoke earlier. and Former to, intern of the House of Commons. Uh, yes, that's correct. I wanted to, um, to ask you to expand a little bit on, in your speech, you referred to it as the Canada brand. And in your book, I believe you referred to it as the consensus in Canadian foreign policy from uh, 1945 to 2006. Uh, you mentioned in passing in your book, uh, the Beaumark missile, the missiles that brought down the Diefenbaker government in 1962-1963, uh, while still referring to that period as a consensus in foreign policy. So I was wondering if you could expand on uh, what constitutes a consensus, even with flashpoints in that relationship. Um, specifically with your relationship with Diefenbaker, I, I know there's, there's a history there. And as well, there's, a, there's been other flashpoints too. You mentioned uh, grabbing a prime minister by the, by the lapels and, and there have been other negative points. So I was just wondering if you could expand on that. Oh, there have been lots of negative points. Uh, and and uh, um, the, um, uh, Mr. Diefenbaker didn't consult me on the bullmark, uh, but at that point in my life, whatever he did was okay with me and I would, uh, I would support it. Uh, obviously, there are going to be a lot of, uh, of disagreements and, and failures and uh, great disruptions. What's interesting is how few there have been uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, both Canadian foreign policy and in terms also of the disagreements that used to exist between national political parties when each was determinedly national. Uh, and I think that happened in part because many of those differences were worked out internally. Uh, and that meant that an institution could contemplate a debate. I mean, I uh, am mindful of the fact that the most serious debate we've ever had about economic nationalism occurred in the, within the confines of one party, the Liberal Party, between uh, Mr. Sharp on the one hand and Mr. Gordon on the other hand. And it was a, uh, it was a very serious debate, uh, but it did not break the party, uh, on the contrary. And I think that that really has been, what is our characteristic? I don't like the word brand. Uh, I use it because I can't think of a synonym, uh, but I don't like it uh, because it sounds uh, too commercial. There is more to us than a brand. We are real. We're a real country. We have real qualities. And one of those is that we are inclined to seek agreement. Uh, that doesn't mean we're traitors to where we come from or the, the view we started with, but we are inclined uh, to seek agreement and to encourage others uh, to do that. And, and not passive agreement agreement on, on moving things forward, agreement on a health care system, agreement on a free trade agreement, uh, agreement on, on these, uh, these other matters. And I think that that, um, and by the way, that pervades our society. John Graham is here and was with me in, uh, uh, in Central America when we were uh, dealing with uh, responses to internal problems there, and there was a need for peacekeepers. Uh, and we came down with three or four members of the Canadian Armed armed forces who, um, uh, were, um, whose skill was in drawing people together, which they were able to do in the Contadora process so there. That's the characteristic, uh, that we are inclined to seek constructive agreement. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Clark. Thank you very much for sharing your wisdom with us. My name is Hamid Georgiani, and I'm one of the lucky guys who won one of the books. Oh. <laughs> I was... Uh, really intrigued with your uh, comment about being able to uh, compromise. Hmm. And in that context, and the context of the upcoming uh, conference in Paris about the climate change, I was wondering how we can position ourselves to actually start anew the movement on the, uh, not, I'm not talking about a, a very uh, uh, adverse milit uh, militaristic movement, but a uh, typical movement that uh, similar to the one that Pearson started with promoting peace. We have a lot of opportunities in Canada. UNESCO has, uh, if I remember correctly, 16 biosphere reserves in Canada. Mm -hmm. We have, in other way, the laboratoire which would be needed to show 
how um, different factors interact vis-a-vis -vis the climate and also the environment at large. What do you think would take? I mean, how can we start this, this movement again? Uh, is it going to be organizations such as CIC, which is not necessarily in the business of environment, but part of that diplomacy, the new approach to diplomacy, perhaps that would be a vehicle that one could consider. I would be interested in your perspectives on this. Thank you very much. Uh, the reason I raised it here is that we're all in the business of environment. Uh, we can't help but be. And uh, the agreements that are reached are going to have to be international. So it is, it's very much uh, the appropriate topic for, uh, uh, for this group. But um, I think that one place to start, uh, you told me some things this moment I didn't know about before. If there are um, constructive things being done uh, that are of interest to other Canadians and others beyond Canada, uh, we, should, uh, we, we should be trying to make those better known because this is an issue on which uh, progress has to occur. But the other reality is that there um, is a sense of very sharp differences among the communities interested in this issue. Uh, there is a sense that uh, on the part of many Aboriginal leaders uh, that, uh, that to enter into some kind of agreement would, be, uh, would betray not only their immediate interests but uh, part of their heritage. And on the other side, there is a sense that uh, they are being old-fashioned and, uh, and irrelevant and uh, not focusing on the issues. We have to build down those prejudices, and the only way to do that that I know of is to bring people together. Part of the reason that I'm interested in this issue is that uh, while I uh, am not in Calgary as much as I once was, I'm in touch with some of the discussions that are occurring between environmental organizations and energy companies uh, in that city. And, uh, and there were pretty hard lines on each side as people came into those discussions. Uh, the lines are less important now than the, the progress they can make together, and, and quite a bit of that is happening. I attended the Conférence de Montréal last week in Montreal and was struck by uh, the degree to which um, CEOs of major energy companies who were speaking uh, were taking a, a much broader view and a much more conciliatory line towards climate change issues than they had three or four or five years ago. Uh, that was not fake. Uh, that was the result of discussions that have been occurring uh, within their, uh, their midst for some time. Um, and so I, I think that the, but I think that there are these sharp divisions. There are environmentalists now, people sincerely committed to the environmental movement who uh, will not enter the room with uh, someone from an energy company. And, and I, I think less vice versa now, but there was a time uh, when it was vice versa. And I think we, we have to, so we have to look for the common grounds on which we can move forward, but we also have to be very realistic about how sharp the divisions are and try to work them down. And uh, I'm convinced that if you try that on this issue uh, with compromise on both sides, uh, progress can be made. Can it be made in time? Um, it can be started in time uh, for a responsible or a, uh, a forward uh, moving position for Canada at the December 2015 uh, conference. Thank you very much, Mr. Clark. Uh, I enjoyed your presentation and it was very educational. My name is Akbar Manusi. I'm professor at the School of Business, Carter University. My question is, uh, during your short period of time of prime ministership, you made a very controversial, controversial decision in Middle East and uh, as a conservative, progressive conservative government. And so at the present conservative uh, government we have, they also have made the same sort of controversial policy in the Middle East. The question is, is this the best service for the Canadian, Canadian interest or having a little more balanced policy, which on the Liberal Party we always had, it was more beneficial. Thank uh, you. I had the um, experience, which I wouldn't recommend to any of you, of having to get up in the House of Commons and announce that I had made a mistake on uh, the decision I took in that region. But also it's important to distinguish uh, between what was a mistake on that issue? Uh, Michael Bell has left the room, but he got me, got me out of the mistake. Uh, uh, and uh, what is clearly a quite deeply held view on the part of leading members of the, uh, 
uh, the government of Canada. And I, I don't want to simplify that, and I'm, I'm saying that descriptively. I, I'm not uh, loading it with anything, uh, uh, with anything else. My own view is that we are better off, the world is better off, with what had traditionally been called a balanced approach uh, to the region. Uh, and um, in fact, that approach was balanced. And it was conducted in the context of an understanding of the very real limits upon what Canada could do. Uh, we are not going to be a central player in those, uh, those issues. We are not a neighbor, we are not a superpower, uh, and uh, we can have an influence, as we have had uh, in, in the past, but that was as a result of being able to uh, uh, be accepted, uh, our bona fides being accepted by all relevant sides. Thank you. Bonsoir, M. Clark. Louise Wimet, je suis la présidente du groupe de réflexion sur l'Afrique. Merci beaucoup pour ces propos très inspirants ce soir. L'Afrique, comme le reste du monde, est en profond changement. Et j'aurais simplement une, une, une question pour vous. L'Afrique, en fait, l'Afrique progresse énormément sur différents points économiques et autres, mais il y a aussi encore beaucoup de pays fragiles. So my question to you tonight is, what advice would you give to the Canadian government and Canadians more broadly about engaging with Africa today in the 21st century? Uh, je crois que l'Afrique est en plein changement. Et uh, ce n'est pas du tout le, le, le continent uh, de, de hier. Uh, nous avons parlé plus tôt aujourd'hui uh, d'une expérience que j'ai eue aux conférences de Montréal quand j'ai assisté à une réunion Uh, sponsored by uh, uh, IDRC, sponsored by RDRC, uh, avec um, les jeunes innovateurs africains. Uh, L'un des groupes était AIM, c'est AIM, je crois, et uh, un autre était une, une, jeune, une, uh, une jeune femme qui a, a stimulé uh, l'innovation parmi cette... Ça, c'est le, le visage actuel d'Afrique. It's not the face of Africa, every, Africa, Africa everywhere. Uh, nowhere is the truism more accurate than the, that, that there are intense differences in that continent. Uh, but there are some important uh, changes being made, some important progress being made. What is interesting to me is that in, in some of my experience, uh, parents of means who 10 years ago had taken their higher education elsewhere and stayed elsewhere, not because the salaries were better, but because they didn't trust the schools at home, are now taking their kids back to Africa to go into the schools at home. Uh, this is highly anecdotal, but it is happening in countries, some of them uh, still troubled. Uh, so I think there is a difference in the mentality of Africa. The challenge is there is not a difference in the image of Africa. What I want to do with that IDRC project is uh, take those two impressive young people, I defy anyone in this room uh, to watch that and not be impressed by it, and take them on a circuit so that people who, who have no knowledge of Africa, no particular prejudices, but prejudices nonetheless, can have a sense of, uh, as, to, as to what is, uh, uh, is there. One of the challenges in that continent, of course, is that there is, against a background of, call it prejudice, uh, underestimating the potential of the people in the continent, there are all these terrible things that happen. And we tend to define, Boko, define Nigeria by Boko Haram. Uh, we tend to define the country by its past or present extremities, e extreme actions. And that's uh, unfortunate. But again, the only way to change that, I think, is to increase the actual access that people have to a, to a current reality. That's great, Mr. Clark. If, okay, if, good. Um, uh, why don't we just stay here on the, the strad? Yes. Um, it, it would take, keep our seats here. And uh, it, you are a very cooperative audience because uh, we need to finish now both for CPAC and for the kitchen. And so uh, Randolph Harold, the uh, vice president of the branch and uh, extremely uh, essential person in our operation, uh, is going to, to thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much, David and Mr. Clark. Now I know why we all came. Uh, thank you to Canada's youngest ever Prime Minister. You still share so passionately your vision for the future of our country and the potential we have to build 
on the successes we've made in our diverse society, in how we lead Canada in a century of change, you argue for Canada to reassert its international position as an agent of change, diplomacy, and peace, and drawing on our history, successes, and the unique qualities that we possess. Today, you have described for us an ambitious but vitally important role for Canada, for the world's benefit, but also for our own. And by sharing stories of Canadians and organizations here who have become successful and made a difference, you've encouraged us to realize our value within our own borders and beyond for what we can bring to the world. And you know, tonight we have here in the audience many of those who share that vision and with you have helped build those stories of making a difference for Canada. You know, Mr. Clark, you bring out the best in Canadians. Many of them are here tonight to recognize your stellar contributions and your integrity as a leader. I just want to recognize a few from the trenches, mainly for the benefit of some of the younger people who uh, might be interested. Starting with uh, an elder statesman, Michael Shenstone, Order of Canada, who convinced you and Flora MacDonald Michael, stand up and take a bow. That, <laughs> he convinced you that uh, the plan developed with our man in Tehran, Ken Taylor, for rescuing the U.S. hostages would work. And you had the guts, I, sh I should say, sorry, the political fortitude to lay the uh, country's reputation on the line to do what was right, and it worked. Thank goodness it worked. <laughs> Others, such as David Halton, one of Canada's most acclaimed journalists, serving in Moscow, Paris, London, Washington, and as police, chief political correspondent for the CBC in Ottawa from 1978 to 1991. I'm sure your paths have crossed. David, stand up and be recognized. We miss your incisiveness, balance, and candor. And Peter DeBell, former diplomat who established the Parliamentary Centre and Institute for Research and Public Policy, with over four decades of experience in parliamentary strengthening and capacity building in Canada and around the world. Thank you for being here tonight, Peter. And Len Edwards, 41 distinguished years of public service, former Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, G8 and G20 Sherpa, Ambassador to Korea and Japan, and continuing to contribute now in retirement to the Asia Pacific Foundation and the Center for International Governance Policy Studies, Global Security and Politics Research with uh, Fenn Hampson, uh, whose mother, Eve Hampson, was sent on his behalf tonight. I think she's here. Yes, she is. And Gar Party, where are you, Gar? Stand up. The son of the rock out in Newfoundland, now a Canadian citizen. <laughs> he wasn't when he was born, you know. Served as a distinguished ambassador and modernized and computerized the protection of Canadians abroad, our consular services. He's now a well-known commentator on issues of Canadian public policy and foreign policy. And Blair Seaborn, Blair Seaborn is here. Right, super. Order of Canada, diplomat from 1948 on the International Control Commission in Vietnam and visited Hanoi five times during the conflict. Later, chair of the International Joint Commission that governs water and environmental issues between Canada and the US very important. Uh, intelligence coordinator in the Privy Council office and uh, Environment Canada deputy. 
The, uh, uh, well, sorry I can't introduce everyone because there are so many more people who have made such outstanding contributions here tonight, Mr. Clark, but I just wanted to recognize them. You're not alone. <laughs> Today's world calls for diplomacy, conciliation and development, and the use of multilateral institutes and forums where the middle power like Canada can use its reputation and influence to move issues forward. Thank you for your call to reassert ourselves on the world stage. With mandate and imagination, we must not give up our ability to lead real international change. And today, still as Canada's youngest Prime Minister, uh, that is what you are doing. You're engaged in what is to come, Globescan being a tremendous new tool, applying your experience on the front lines of Canada's work in promoting democracy and encouraging development in countries like Haiti, Nigeria and Ghana, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. And as an innovator in the developing world, helping teach African farmers to harvest and market medicinal plants, unlocking the value of underwater forests, helping design independent electoral commissions. Mr. Clark, you have played a key role in some of the defining accomplishments of our recent history. The free trade agreement, the fight against apartheid, <clears throat> the end of the Cold War, and the negotiation of the Charlottetown Accord. You connect Canada's past to our future and speak passionately of the potential of modern Canada to make a real difference in today's complex and challenging world. We salute you for your many contributions. Thank you for being with the Canadian International Council tonight. Thank you. Thank you. One uh, further announcement, the, uh, on Tuesday, July 15th, in the late afternoon, the Asia Pacific Working Group will hold an event with Stuart Beck, who is now completing his term as our High Commissioner to India, en route to becoming President of the Asia Pacific Foundation. Uh, and uh, so uh, Bruce Yutzi has organized uh, a meeting with him on July 15th for uh, members of the Asia Pacific Working Group. And all members are welcome, yes indeed. <laughs> Buy your book out near the elevators. Books on Beechwood is still there. And Mr. Clark will sign them after he enjoys his dinner. <laughs> so thank you very much thank for you. coming. <laughs>